Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have Michael O'Connor, the founder and chief executive officer of M Park Partners on the show. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind please taking an extra 30 seconds to head over to wherever you listen to podcasts and rate this podcast you know, for us? It helps us get more listeners and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making time to make that review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Michael O'Connor is an experienced entrepreneur and investor with a well-rounded history cultivated by consulting to and working for Fortune 500 companies. He has a master's degree in business administration focused on finance, strategy, and operations from Carnegie Mellon University and an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Pennsylvania State University. In his role now at M Park Partners, Michael has sourced and acquired eight manufactured housing communities throughout the United States, and he has built a team that operates the communities and offers administrative support. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate the offer to be here today. Yeah. Would you mind starting out by telling our listeners a little about your story and how in the world you got into investing in mobile home parks? Sure. Yeah. It's an interesting story, but I've always been an entrepreneur, always wanted to do something other than, you know, consulting to those clients you mentioned. And the, the hard part is finding out what to do. I've tried starting businesses in the past. Actually, I've started businesses in the past. I've acquired businesses in the past. And just one day, I got in the mobile home park space. We were actually looking for an office for my wife around Delaware. And we were talking to a commercial real estate agent. And I saw this mobile home park for sale. And I thought, this is interesting. We should take a look and potentially buy it. And then it would, it'd been on the market for a while. So I just said, look, let's let's put this aside. We need to find an office first for her practice. So we'll come back to that. And then turned out we didn't really need the office in the end. She she merged with somebody else that had one, but um, came back to it. And I tried to acquire that property. And then, you know, that was probably around 2015 or so. After about six months, the deal fell through, primarily due to septic issues. There are certain laws, especially in Delaware, probably a lot of other states too, where septic is a huge concern. You can't sell a property if it has an issue. Yeah. And those issues for me were insurmountable. So anyhow, that had always been, after that exposure, I started investing in other people who are buying mobile home parks. And I started sourcing deals on the side. This is why I still was working in the consulting business. I found a property in Indiana, acquired it, and then um, just went from there. Eventually became a full-time profession for me. That is so awesome. So you must have had early success investing you know, passively in, in other people's deals, right? Were, you, were those like syndications or were those funds that you were investing in? I was in a, a, a fund, yes. I put a small amount of money into a fund. And at that point, I wasn't doing it because I wanted to, I didn't really want the investment. I wanted exposure to the quarterly reports and, you know, mm. hearing what these people are saying to me. So it was more like a learning adventure, I guess, because I was committed to the space. But yes, I did invest in a, in a fund. That's and great. by the way, the fund, the, the fund eventually paid off. The returns were great. That's but awesome. Now, now we Would just you mind sharing which fund that was? It was one of the um, MHP funds, I think it was called. It was with Frank Rolf. I can't recall the exact name of the fund. It was through one of the crowdfunding platforms like Fundrise or Realty Mogul, one of those okay. kinds of platforms. Interesting. That is so brilliant, though. You know, I've several of our investors are the same, you know, in the same bucket. They want to own mobile home parks someday, they want to get their feet wet and kind of learn as much as possible. So what better way to, you know, invest money with a, an operator already in the space? So that that's fantastic. How else did you get educated, you know, on the mobile home park asset class? 
Well, it's interesting. So going back to the free story to what I just told you, my brother had been, he had been flipping houses in the Washington DC area. And he always told me, you should look into manufactured housing communities. And I thought, this is so off the wall, such a ridiculous idea. Why would I ever do that? And then eventually, as I told you, I did get into this space, but I don't know. It just, it just seemed like it was something that, um, you know, I, I heard about after I was invested in, after I found the one in Delaware, after I did some research on the internet, I learned about some of the forums online, listen to podcasts. I just decided this is what I wanted to do. But quite frankly, most of the education just comes from doing it. You know, it's one thing to read about it on the internet. It's a different thing to actually do it. <laughs> you know, it's a much different thing. So yeah. there's a lot of trial by fire too. Totally. Yeah. Did you end up going to one of the Frank and Dave kind of boot camps at all? Actually, I did. I was invited to the Los Angeles one as an investor. They were extending an invitation. If I would just pay for the airfare, they said you could come out, and take a look. So I did, you know, and it was it was helpful. I think from a very high level, it tells you a lot about the business. I think since then, what I've learned is there's a lot beyond what they tell you. They have a way to approach the industry. It's not the only way to approach the industry, but you know, I've I've learned from them, but I've learned on my own as well. That's great. No, and I agree with you. I think over a, a three day boot camp, it's really tough to cover everything that it encompasses mobile home park investing. Um, but but I thought they do a pretty good job of kind of covering it from a thirty thousand foot view. But you know, one thing I was talking with a a partner investor this morning. And I was telling them when I went to that boot camp, they give you like this this thirty day due diligence handbook, right? Yes. And there's like fifty items in the checklist, and you know we've built on that, and now our due diligence checklist is over three hundred and fifty items long. Like yeah. there's just so many more granular things, you know, if you want to get into it, that you could look at before closing on that property to to try to check. And a lot of it revolves around the utility infrastructure. Um, but maybe you, you know, maybe you'd like to share a little bit about, you know, due diligence and kind of, you know, some of the big things that you look out for when investing into a mobile home park. Well, I think the the first thing is, and this is actually quite easy. It's free. Is just to understand that the market's okay. You know, when I look back and I look at all the properties we purchased, some are in stronger markets, some are in weaker markets. In hindsight, you can really you can really see what the drivers of success are. Um, I wouldn't say we failed in any of our acquisitions at this point, but some are definitely stronger than others. And I think just looking at the market, making sure the housing stock is high priced, the average two bedroom and three bedroom rents are at a certain minimum, you know, those things are really important. For example, if not that we've ever done this, but if you're trying to sell mobile homes, manufactured homes for sixty, seventy thousand dollars and you can buy a brand new stick built house for forty thousand, you know, there are markets out there that are like that, it's going to be hard to compete. I've also learned if you go into a market that's a little bit smaller population wise, it's not only harder to find the tenants, which is what everybody thinks about, it's harder to find the support. Finding contractors is a tremendous problem. So the first thing is it's it's absolutely free. You just do your research, look at the demographics, look at bestplaces.net, make sure the market fits your characteristics. That's really the first step. And then, I mean, due diligence, we could spend all day just talking about that. But the big thing there is, I would say it's the utility infrastructure. We're essentially in the business of providing infrastructure. We provide roads, we provide overhead power lines, sewer lines, water lines. If you're on private sewer, private wells, that's even more of an issue. So looking into those things is absolutely imperative. The As I told you before, the one deal that we, we had under contract failed after a few months, and it was because of the septic issues. We were learning if the septic system were to fail, there's nowhere to replace it. If you need to replace the leach field, for example, you have to remove a home. So you're now removing revenues from your property. We're actually looking into another property right now in Delaware. It's on a septic system, but that's a huge concern. It's just making sure all the utilities are good. 
there's no hidden problems. And if there they are problems, you know, it's one thing to have a sewer line break and spend three or four thousand dollars to fix it. It's another thing to have your package plant break and spend seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to fix it. So we try to avoid those problems. Yeah, and it's it's great to know that upfront what you're getting into to make sure you have adequate reserves and so forth. Let's talk about that septic system, you know, due diligence, because I've I found it kind of tough. And and I've spoken to some other operators that said I kind of went over the overboard on it. But yeah. you know, I bought a property had 67 septic tanks, you know, one behind every home. Mm -hmm. And I I pumped every single one of them during due diligence to make sure there was like no leaks and just to kind of, you know, stick a camera down and kind of inspect the system and inspect the little distribution box and and it was really tough to kind of, you know, tell if the leach field was was working properly or not, right? Like, you know, without like digging down and and mm -hmm. you know, checking it out. So, do you have any tips on that? You know, that's difficult. And in the state where we're looking right now, there's a lot. Basically, if you're selling a property, you have to inspect the septic tanks. The problem is if there's also a law that says if a licensed inspector finds a problem, it has to be reported to the environmental authorities. So this prevents a little bit of a, a situation here. You want to identify the problems, but maybe the seller doesn't want to identify the problems because the leach field may be working okay, say 90% of the time. Mm. So if you just let it go, maybe it will run for another 10, 15, 20 years. But they don't want you inspecting this because now you just told the government, we have a serious problem. And then once they find out, you're now on somebody else's clock. They need to follow you. They need to make sure you're doing this properly. You might have six or 12 months to fix it, but it has to be fixed. And like I said before, in some cases, if, if you don't have room to put a new leach field in, you've got to take out a home and put it there. And none of us want to lose revenues or revenue capacity from our properties. It's tricky. If I mean, if you were just starting out, you may want to stay away from private utilities, including septic tanks. But that's my concern is they're just going to fail at some point. They don't last forever. And depending on what the tenants do, they can really mess them up. They can flush diapers, wipes, all this stuff gets into the leach field and they clog the whole system up. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And we've, for the most part, stayed away from private utilities because of exactly that reason. But yeah, I think, you know, making sure that, hey, if the leach field goes bad, hey, do you have room to install a new one? And oh yeah, the code in 2024 looks a lot different than the code in 1965 when the park was built. Now you, you might need more room. And that's a really good point that a lot of operators don't look at is, hey, if it does go bad, are you gonna be able to have the room necessary to you know, to, to put in a new field. So good points there. Michael, what do you think is the toughest hurdle in mobile home park investing? Toughest hurdle, I would say it's just general rehabbing of homes. You know, it's, it's inevitable, but we're in the business of providing the infrastructure, renting the lot. We prefer not to own the physical home itself. And um, of course, we can't get around that. Sometimes there's an abandoned home, you take it over, or if you want to infill the community, you have to bring in homes and then you own them until you can either sell them or rent them to a tenant until they buy them out from you. But it's inevitable. You're going to own the homes at some point. And if you own them, you have to maintain them. The maintenance of the homes is, I'd say, by far our biggest problem. That's not just the full rehab, but um, I'll give you an example. We had a situation a couple of years ago in Ohio where we had a tenant in the home and this tenant had some, they seemed to have some kind of issues, but they kept ripping the thermostat off the wall. And, you know, we would send a contractor in to put the thermostat back in the wall in January. It's like 20 degrees outside. And you know, by law, we have, to, if we own the home, we have to provide heat. So what do you do when the tenant keeps ripping the thermostat off the wall and you keep putting it back? And then finally, no contractors willing to go into the home because that tenant isn't very well kept. They're a little bit untidy and, you know, the contractor just doesn't want to go in the home anymore. So now you're stuck. You can't fix the home. Nobody's willing to go do it. 
And then, you know, you can go get the, the tenant can go to the court, get an injunction requiring you to fix the home. And, you know, your hands are tight. You can't really do it. So I would say by far maintaining the homes is the biggest thing. We prefer if we don't own the home while somebody's living in it, that way we don't have to be worried about that problem. And then if eventually the home goes vacant because they move somewhere else, they sell the home to us. At that point, we can just send in a remodel crew and fix the whole thing up and make it like new again. But just just maintaining them and even hiring these remodel crews can be very challenging. You're managing this from you know 700 miles away. You're relying on what you can see in a cell phone video, or you're relying on your property manager who's you know may not really understand construction. You're trying to manage these projects from afar, and it's it's quite challenging. I agree. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing you mentioned is, you know, finding good contractors, right? Because you're not able to just go and hire your local general contractor to to renovate, you know, a couple mobile homes in your park. You know, you're going to have to use more of a a chuck in a truck handyman type of athlete. And they, you know, they are not always the most reliable. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah chuck in the truck you know they they come they're good for six months next thing you know they disappear you don't know where they went yeah don't want to know where they went but they're just not there anymore it's hopefully nice. they got the project done and then some of the times you know depending on who you're dealing with chuck takes the money and runs you have half a project done you know perhaps he insisted up front half cash and to him yeah. that was the lottery that was it and then that it was it your project's over Tell us about your most recent acquisitions. You know, how have you guys pivoted around higher interest rates? You know, are you still able to get deals done the last 24 months? Our last deal was in 2021. So that was before a lot of the inflation kicked in. So that really hasn't applied to us right now. We are looking at a couple of deals. We have a verbal agreement on one right now. The way I see the interest rates going in the next year is they're probably going to go down a little bit. But if we want to get a deal done and we want to, you know, it, it's a tough balance because the sellers, they don't look at the interest rate. They don't care. You know, if the property was paid for 40 years ago, it doesn't matter what the interest rate is today because they're not paying the mortgage note, the new buyer is. But they see it as my property is worth X and it doesn't matter what that interest rate is. So if we want to do the deal, most likely, you know, we we try to get a, adjust the price a little bit based on the market conditions, but that only goes so far. So the one we're looking at right now, we're just going to have more cash into it to keep the the payments low. Ideally, it's it you know it's going to impair our financial outcome a little bit, not a huge amount, but we just have to be well. We also have to be more conservative. You know, there are certain properties that you might have taken more of a risk on in the past. Now we can't do that. It's just too risky with these interest rates. So we just need to find something that's cash flowing today. It's going to meet our metrics. And then hopefully the seller will agree with the, the price we can offer. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. What, what, what's your strategy? Are you looking for value add deals with lots of infill and, and rehabs? Are you looking for more stabilized properties? And what does your, what does your current portfolio look like? Sure. We like value add. We we buy properties that are under managed in some way. Um, I'd say the value levers we're looking for, there's three primary value levers if we can find them. First is if we can find the property where the rent should be some amount and it's some smaller percentage of that, that's the ideal situation. For example, the market rent is 500, but the owner's only been charging 300. That would be our ideal condition because we could buy the property, raise the rents over a few years to the market value. And it really doesn't take any capital investment to do that. It just takes some time. The second thing we like to do is find properties that have not been submetered. And when I say submetering, I mean water and sewer in particular. It's just amazing what you can do with submeters. You know, you could put, say, $500 into a mobile home to put a meter on it with the labor included. You buy Wi Fi infrastructure, you have Wi Fi meters. And then all these tenants who thought water was free and you start charging them for their fair share, they realize, okay, water's not free. Your, your, you know, your expense for water and sewer, which is huge in the mobile home park business, it goes down so much. And for every dollar that goes down, 
that's more, um, you know, for whatever cap rate you're purchasing at or selling at, that's more, that, that raises the value of the property by that much money. So that's the second thing. You know, you could say, depending on the size of the park, for twenty dollars to $50,000, you put these meters on, they pay for themselves in eight months, and then you've just added a million dollars on the price of the property. Third thing we like in value add is infill. Of course, that one's a lot harder. You know, when I first started out, wanted to do infill, but it was so time consuming. You know, you're doing everything, you're sourcing deals, you're managing the employees. Who has time to infill? One home infill probably has 15 or 20 steps with the permitting, the five or six different contractors, you know, so that was sort of a part-time side venture. Now we have people who are specifically devoted to that. So that's a very part of very big part of our strategy as well. It's a little more expensive, it takes more capital to do it, but there are programs out there that help. But I'd say those three, anything we can find that have those three opportunities, that's what we're looking for. Okay, awesome. And where's your portfolio now? You mentioned Ohio. Where else? You have eight communities. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, we have eight communities. We're we're mostly based in well, we're based in Delaware, mm -hmm. but we've got one community in Delaware. We just bought a couple of years ago. It's our first one in the state. Five are in Indiana, mostly from the mid part of the state and north. We've got one in Kentucky, just south of Louisville, and then we've got one property southeast of columbus ohio very cool let's see what mistakes in mobile home park investing have you made that you know our listeners can learn from and myself well what mistakes i mean <laughs> it is a trial by fire business if you've never been in it before but i'd say dealing with a lot of those contractors earlier on we were we were doing a lot of home refurbs and i know andrew you guys do this i think i've asked you by email before you know do you have your own crews or how do you handle this but I don't know how many times we've um, we bought a used home, we brought it in, we realized it needs all this work, we hired a crew to do it, spent all this money, they did a half-assed job, if I can say that, sorry. <laughs> and then, you know, you rework it, you do it again, because they, they messed it up, you already paid them, you realize later they didn't do the sub floor right, it's falling through, you do it again, you do it again, you do the same remodel three times in three months, now the price you have invested in this 30 year old home is the price of a brand new one you could have just bought a brand new one and left it at that everything would have been good so that's one big mistake we don't do so much with used homes anymore just for that reason we like to buy brand new homes it's just so much more reliable they're so much easier to infill than it is to manage and remodel projects but what other mistakes i mean there's countless mistakes but it it all comes down to managing these contractors they're difficult to manage. I'd say that's where most of our mistakes have been. We've had a few walk away, like I said, pay them half the money up front because you can't find another contractor. Nobody agrees to come unless you pay half up front. They show up, they take the check and they just leave right then and there that fast. We've we've been there as well. And it's yeah, it's difficult. You try to hedge your bets as much as you can. But yeah, in some of those smaller markets, it's just it's tough to find good contractors, you know. Exactly. So Okay, that is awesome. What does your operation look like? Are you vertically integrated? You manage in house, you know, plus you mentioned the project management. You guys have some infill, you know, team members. What does that look like? Yes. So we are mostly a centralized organization. We have community managers at each of our communities. In some cases, one community manager may handle multiple communities within the same area. As far as all the back office functions, which include accounting, finance, bookkeeping, marketing, even sales, we do that from remote. So we have a um, director of operations who's based in Ohio. She handles, she basically overlooks all of our managers, but she also does sales and marketing. We also have an overseas team. We're shifting more of our sales overseas. So actually the leasing, actually all the customer service is answered overseas. The people that answer the phones there, they will handle level one sales. They'll handle all the paperwork, all the lease preparations, all the document preparations. They provide all that paperwork to the on-site managers who, you know, physically you might have to show up with a piece of paper or hand over the keys. That's all done locally, but that's all being directed from somebody on the backside. We also have a roving regional manager who travels to all of our properties. 
recently, we just started to build a maintenance team. This just started about a month ago. We hired one person. He's been with us for, you know, about a month now. It's going well. So if this continues to go well, we're going to expand upon that and potentially start an uh, installation business and offer that service as a um, profit center. Not first of all, we're going to do it for ourselves, but then eventually we may roll it out as a profit center as a third party service. So yes, I guess we are vertically integrated and becoming more so. Very cool. And and the the maintenance person, are they doing like rehabs or, you know, you said you you like majority tenant owned home communities, right? Yes. Okay. And are they so, doing that kind of stuff or do you have a park owned home portfolio as well? We do have a park on home portfolio, not because we want to, but we do, depending on the sale methodology, we may do rent to owns through a rent credit program. Mm -hmm. So inevitably we're going to own some of the homes for a period of time, but that person is going to be doing any of the minor repairs. You know, if somebody calls because of the toilet stuff, although we like to, you know, stay away from that kind of an issue it does come up. So that person will be responsible for those things. But we're really trying to focus him on, and I say him because there's only one right now. We are trying to build a team of multiple people that have all the skills, you know, the electrical, the plumbing, the carpentry, where they can just go into a home, spend two or three weeks there, completely remodel it, and then move on to the next one. So we're we're trying to find people who can help us with all the different skills. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So Michael, let's flip the tables here. If you were looking to passively invest into, you know, a mobile home park syndication, what are the most important things that that you would look for to ensure success? Well, I would say you need to find out what experience the syndicator has. There are a lot of people who are trying to get into business. They've never done it before. You, I, we haven't been in the business for 50 years. We started out, you know, at some point. So you really need to make sure that the people know what they're doing. There are a lot of people from, from what I'm seeing, there are a lot of people on social media channels and they're, you know, they're, they're trying to find investors. And, you know, for some of these people who are trying to find investors, I've seen on the backside, I've seen some of their deals that are for sale. You know, they're on the one hand, they're trying to find the next investor, but on the other hand, the portfolio doesn't seem to be operating that well. So, and some of them, you know, they got into the business quickly. They're trying to grow very fast, but they're not necessarily putting all the pieces in place. They're not putting all the infrastructure in place to run their business. You know, they don't have the director of operations. They don't have the finance staff. They don't have the maintenance staff. Maybe it's, maybe it's just a couple of guys in an office with 2000 units, you know, that's a bit of a concern. I think you need, number one, you need the experience, but number two, you need to have the resources to manage these things. They don't manage themselves. People will tell you, you just hire a manager, pay him $10 per lot per month, and it'll just run itself. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. No. You need people and you need a lot of people and yes. somebody has to manage those people. Totally. No, I agree. I, I wrote down when you were saying that there's a lot of people that are, you know, investors right and capital raisers but not good operators yes and the operators part in mobile home parks because it's affordable housing is a little bit tougher right like I have some friends that are apartment syndicators and you know they they can hire a third party property manager that that manages 10,000 units in the market and is a a very reputable source that's going to you know be affordable but also do it the right way but in the mobile home park space, there's there's nothing like that, you know, to get the really hands-on management you need, you know, I believe you need to do it yourself. And you're, you're exactly right. You need uh, resources, you need people. And that's why hiring overseas has been so huge for us because it just gives us three times as many people compared to hiring US-based people for, for all these operational tasks. And it just helps us go deeper. You know, our collections team, you know, makes probably three times as many phone calls and text messages as as a, a single U.S. person could do. And we just saw, I was just joking with my team the other day, we saw how many phone calls you make per year for, a, I think it was for deal sourcing, it was on, on the website. But no, I 100% agree with you. Everybody I always talk to, I say, it's so much easier to run a bigger operation than a smaller one, yeah. because, you know, you have your team, 
but maybe let's say finance, for example, you've got accounts payable and accounts receivable. If you're one size, one guy does all of that. Mm. Once you get to a certain size, you can have one person that just does accounts receivable and a different person that gets does accounts payable. So you have this specialization that really helps as you get bigger. The but scale, anybody that yeah. wants to, if, if, you, if somebody wants to invest in the business passively, I would say you really need to find somebody who has this infrastructure put in place. If it's three guys on social media raising funds all day and they have no back staff, then that would concern me. And I'm sure you you had to start somewhere, as did I, but I managed my first five parks myself. And oh, yeah. I can tell you one thing, our parks are way more optimized today <laughs> than they were when it was just me and I was opening the mail and putting checks in envelopes and sending them out and, you know, changing ball valves under homes sometimes, you know. Absolutely. So I, that and team, it's interesting. You're you're right. When when you do those things, you learn, okay, how where am I spending my time? So earlier on I was doing bookkeeping till like midnight because it was yeah. a day job. Now you're doing bookkeeping. It's like, okay, I need to give this up. You give that up and all of a sudden you have all this freedom. So much more you can do, so much more strategic thing thinking you can do. But even things like how do we receive mail? That was my thing a couple months ago. I was thinking, how do we receive mail? How can we not do this? You know, and eventually we came up with an automated process where paper mail gets automatically scanned by a service in New York City. Then we get it comes to our Google Drive, and then it automatically goes on the server onto everybody's computer. You know, things like that are the things you have to think about when you get bigger. And you know, a lot of these money raisers, I don't think they think about those things. Yeah, yeah, it adds up, and then you're behind the eight ball. You know, because exactly. now your your water bills aren't getting paid. You know, your your water's getting shut off to your whole community of tenants. You know, those types of things. I've heard horror stories that those can really happen. So, yeah, it's it's tough. It's a it's a good business, but it's definitely not easy. It takes you know elbow grease. You got to roll up your sleeves, and there's a lot of hands on nature that's that's needed. And and the, the good operators, I think, do that. So, absolutely. Um, that's important. What does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes, Michael, and why? Well, I like something that's in a nice market. It's not you necessarily fine. You mentioned that earlier, and I just want to yeah. reiterate. So the, the two metrics you mentioned would be two and three bedroom rents, right? Is there a certain yes. number? Like, do you want those over a thousand a month or 1500 a month? You know, and then you also mentioned housing prices. Like, is that median house price you're looking at? And just trying to get that over a hundred thousand, over two hundred thousand. Is there any specifics you can give us on that? Yeah, you know, we we typically we don't have a limit like that, but you know, a lot of our properties in Indiana, the when, when we purchased the lot rents were under two hundred, we're now above three hundred, and and we we take them up from there. I would say once you get lower than that, um, it starts becoming a problem. Or I shouldn't say it's a problem, but it's a different operation. You know, if 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 you're in a market that's charging 150 a month, I don't know if that's enough money for us to really pay our expenses and do very well. I'm sure somebody can do that if you're geared towards that kind of a thing. But I'd say, you know, lot rents, if we're at say 325 and up, stabilized. I don't want to say sta stabilized, because if if you can tell me this property has market lot rents of 350, but the owners are only charging 150, to us that's a gold mine. That aside, I guess physical characteristics, besides all the due diligence with the infrastructure, we kind of like the parks that are a lot of single wide homes. We're not really into the high end parks, you know, the five star with the marina and the golf course and the, the restaurant clubhouse. We just don't want to deal with that because that's extra service. The one thing that's nice about this business is I could probably go away for a year and do nothing and come back. And the business would be relatively intact. Maybe there would be some attrition of revenues and some other issues, but for the most part, it would still be here. But if we're trying to sell you know, hamburgers at the clubhouse and you don't show up for a year, things can go bad really fast. So we don't like the one-star properties unless there's a clear path to make them better. You know, The really low price for the market where you have a lot of hard to deal with tenants with the kinds of issues they have. We don't like that kind of thing, but we're also not into it. The opposite extreme, you know, the 55 plus retired people, they pay $200,000 for the home and the lot rents a thousand dollars after that. You know, we don't do a lot of that either. 
In fact, we don't do any of that right now. We're in the middle. We like the three-star parks. Same. Yeah, that's what our portfolio is as well for the most part. You made a good point there, though. You said, if I go away for a year and I come back, you know, most of the business is, is going to be there. It, it's not going to be this mass exodus of, of people that just, you know, exit entirely because you have some systems set up and, and, and because it's reliable, right? You have sticky tenants. This is where they live. This is not, you know, where they're like self-storage. You're not storing stuff yes. somewhere where, hey, you know, they could disappear in 30 days. It's not an RV park where, hey, you know, they're there on the weekends and then they're, you know, no one's there during the week. So that's a really good point. I haven't heard anyone say that before. Yeah, even compared to multifamily, you know, we, we've we never really done multifamily, but we looked into the stats on it before. But I believe it's the, the average 10 years, maybe two years, which means you've got 50% annual turnover. You know, if you have 50% annual turnover, I mean, for us, that would be devastating because every time we have turnover in a home, we have to refurbish it. Yeah. We don't want to refurbish a home every two years. We want to put somebody in a home, have them stay there for 40 years. That's our business model. That's what we like. And it's possible, right? Like, that's why we're doing this. It works. People, once they own the home, the turnover is so low and it's because of the affordability, right? Lot rents, 325 bucks a month, 350 that's a right. month. That's so, so cheap. Yeah, and Andrew, they can't they can't go anywhere because if imagine you're in the market, like we have a property just outside of Chicago. I think the rents it, it's four fifty, four sixty, somewhere thereabouts. If you buy a home from us, and let let's say we did a rent to own, and you pay a seven hundred dollars a month for three years, then we just give the home to you for free after that. So now your rent's not seven hundred anymore; it's four sixty eight, and we transfer the title to you, so you own it. You can't go anywhere practically because if you want to find another home at the next community down the road, even if the lot rent is the same, you still have to buy that home. So now you're back to paying $700 a month for so many years until you can buy the home or you're purchasing a brand new home for 50 or 60 or $70,000. So there's, you know, we have those barriers to, to leaving. It's, it's, um, makes it very Housing. compelling yeah. to stay for a long time. Agreed. Agreed. If you if we'll just invert for a second in honor of Charlie Munger, if you wanted to, you know, run a mobile home park into the ground, you know, what what would what would you do? What would I do? OK, so first of all, I'd probably stop screening tenants. Mm. We'd stop looking at their income. That's probably the quickest way to destroy a community. Yep. You take the first tenant that comes in off the street. They've been evicted. Actually, we had this happen a few years ago. The, the person was evicted, at least on the court records, there were 11 evictions in a year and they applied to live with us. I don't even know how that's possible, you know, because it takes yeah. two or three months to go through one at least, but somehow they had 11 evictions on the record. Yeah, it's simple as that. If you let the tenant base get such a low quality that people don't have jobs, they don't have reliable income, that could be a problem. That's a huge problem. Thank you for mentioning that because we switched, this is how serious it is. We switched background check providers. We were with AmRent, which is plugged into Rent Manager. Yeah. We switched to another one that was like this, you know, it was like a cool new kind of add-on that they grouped in with Rent Manager as well. And, you know, we started using them. And sure enough, our turnover started to go up. And we said, what's going on here? So we mm -hmm. looked in and they were only doing a background check based on like the last five years or so, like instead of going deeper and and they were only doing it based on the state that the person lived in instead oh, right. of doing a national background check. So it's like little things like that that you don't think, you know, would be that much of a difference. Tremendous difference. So I agree, you gotta screen them. And I think income is the most important thing, getting their pay stubs, you know, calling the employer, hey, how reliable is this person? How, how long have they been there? Yeah. And that has just, given us such a good insight into yeah, I remember earlier on when when you know when I was doing everything including the sales you know we we would look and somebody would come in and say yeah I run my own contracting company um you know here's an example of a check I just got from a client and you know it looks good but that's hit or miss I mean that's great to be in your own business and to drive your success but from a landlord perspective it's horrible you can't prove that person's income. You know, a lot of it they take under the table. It, well, it could be they take a lot of it under the table or they just don't have the income, you know, one or the other. Um, but 
But either way, that that can be very disappointing if you let those people come in. They 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 can destroy. No, number one, once they're in, you have to go through a legal process to get them out. Mm-hmm. That takes time. Secondly, when they leave, the home's probably not in the same condition as when it came in. So now you've got to put a bunch of money in to refurbish it. So a lot of this goes away if you just have some minimum standards. Totally agree. I just had Frank Rolf on the show and he mentioned, you know, driving through a park. And if you see a lot of like contractor vehicles, you know, like a lot yeah. of trucks and, you know, Joe's handyman on the side, if you see like the majority of the tenants or those type of residents, you know, roofers and things like that, you know, it, it might not, you know, bode well in the end, because again, inconsistency of income, you know, they're, they're busy during the summer but in the winter, they they have no income because there's no roofing jobs. So I that's an interesting you know perspective that uh, yeah I I totally get it. It's yeah. scary. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What what do you think is the biggest threat to mobile home park investing? I would say it's local government. Yeah. We've had situations where the the local government they might either like you or dislike you. Yep. And usually you can determine that pretty quickly, but a lot of them don't understand the grandfathering laws for real estate in our country. And they try to exert pressure where they're not really allowed to. I know there's a bunch of Supreme Court cases on this where, you know, a local government will say, hey, look, you know, your setbacks are only eight feet between your homes and the new code is they're 10 feet. So when you take out that mobile home, you know, because eventually some of them have to be demolished and replaced. Yeah. So they tell you when you take it out, we're not going to let you, we're not going to issue a permit to replace it unless you meet the new setbacks. But it's impossible to meet the new setbacks because the lots are already there. They're already spaced apart so many feet. So usually it's illegal for them to do that, but either they don't know it or they don't care. I think usually they don't know it. And the problem is if they don't know it, you have to educate them, and it's not an easy process. It could take litigation. It could, at, at a minimum, it could take yeah. just hiring an attorney to help educate them that what they're doing by denying this permit is illegal. Yeah. And that's a huge problem. We face that where we've had to spend, you know, five thousand dollars for a one day meeting with an attorney with the building department just to explain to them that you are in violation of state law by not issuing this permit. Eventually they came around, but you know, that took six to 12 months to, to get them to issue the first permit. So I'd say it's that a lot of them, a lot of them look at the zoning ordinances and the zoning changes, changes all the time. But the fact is when the property was built, perhaps 50 or 60 years ago, they may not have had the zoning. And in most jurisdictions, if not all, you know, we are grandfathered to that date. But the local, you know, the local bureaucrats don't know that. A lot of times they're not educated in this. They they know how to issue permits. They know how to read their code. But they don't know, they don't have an intimate knowledge of property laws in the United States. That's a huge concern. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, we have a, a park and the local building inspector just does not like trailer parks. And exactly. every little thing he you know, exacerbates it and just makes it this huge, you know, hurdle. And it's like, oh, you know, all of your smoke detectors are not wired. They're battery powered. You need to update all of that. And it's, it's just like he, he over exaggerates every little thing. And we, we have to accommodate, you know, because he's, he's the guy that's going to give us the certificate of op- occupancy. And exactly. you know, I think it's been, it's been a hurdle, but there's people like that too, that just have this stigma of, oh, this is a mobile home park. This is, you know, a trailer park. We want to make it as hard for them as possible because we want this whole area redeveloped into multifamily apartments. And, you know, it didn't happen. We're just exactly. there to preserve the, the housing stock and they don't really like that. So they're going to make no, it a little like harder that. for us, which is that's really right. bad. Michael, you uh, you've shared a ton with us. Thank you so much. If any of our listeners would like to get a hold of you, what would be the best way for them to do so? Probably the best way is to call the office. It's at our website at mparkpartners.com and just ask for Mike. Simple as that. Awesome. What's one last bit of information 
or important advice you would give an interested passive mobile home park investor before we sign off? Oh boy. I would say that this is a very interesting segment of real estate. It's probably the most stable segment there is. You know, just looking back a few years, we went through the COVID pandemic, revenues didn't drop. Or if they dropped, they dropped a couple of percentage points. If you're investing in something like a couple of multifamilies in New York City were very famous in that they went completely vacant overnight. Hotels went almost vacant overnight. Office had a serious turn back on the revenues. But in manufactured housing, we have never seen anything like that. It's very stable. Love that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, Michael. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. That's it for today, folks. Uh, a friendly reminder for you to please leave a review if you got value out of this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.